Hello and welcome to Noosh Extras. I'm Chris Noosh and what you're watching is me drawing one of my commission pieces which is a tiger. The person who commissioned this from me asked for a happy but yet still strong tiger. I'm drawing this on an iPad using an Apple Pencil. The app that I'm using is called Sketchbook Pro. So for this video, I'm going to go step by step through my process and how I go from an original first sketch and take that all the way to the finished product. Sketched out the face pretty roughly and then I went back and finished it, did all the finishing details. Right now I'm drawing in all the stripes, which everything that I'm doing right in this section is a note to myself for the carving section, which is the most important part of my whole process. So this is all information for me to use when I'm carving. I take then a beautiful piece of birch, throw a magic pen at it, and then boom, tiger on wood. Then I sit down at my scroll saw and cut out the shape of the wood following the outline of the tiger. It makes a horrible noise, this noise right here, but it does the job well. Now comes the fun part. My favorite part, the carving. What you're watching is me carving it, obviously, but not in real time. This is me carving it at seven and a half times speed. Obviously my hands do not move this fast. I like to start with the face, the areas with the most interest, the most detail first, because when I first start carving, I have the most interest in what I'm doing. So I can pay attention and really focus on the most important areas first. Not that I don't put the same level of detail into the rest of the carving, but there are certain areas of the work where I'm following the lines that I've drawn pretty precisely. Like in the face, I'm not using a whole lot of liberties with this area. I'm pretty much tracing out the lines that I've drawn cleanly and precisely. I'm adding a couple little extra details here to add a little bit of interest in the nose and carving around those details pretty precisely. As you can see, a running theme in this area is precisely. Now, even though this is sped up seven and a half times, it's still going to take you about 10 minutes to watch me carve this out. I've left in every stroke from beginning to end. I haven't shortened it in any way. I thought that that would be the fairest way to show the amount of work that goes into these pieces. And some people have even told me that they find it quite relaxing to watch. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot. I'm just going to interject here and there during this process. I'm going to let you relax. Watch this. Hopefully you enjoy it. If you skip through, that's fine. But please just enjoy. And I'll, I'll be with you here and there every now and then to kind of fill you in on what I'm doing. I'm going to act kind of like a baseball announcer and let the scene breathe a little bit. Let you listen to the carving marks, the wood flying. Let you think about what you're doing today, what you need to do today, what you should be doing instead of watching this YouTube today. But I'm glad you're watching this YouTube video today. And hopefully, you're glad that I uploaded it. Now that I'm starting on the back of the tiger, it's time to talk about those little notes that I wrote to myself. The stripes that I drew, I didn't draw solid stripes. I didn't want them to be so bold that they overtook the whole piece. 
you can see that I carve in one single direction. I, the notes that I wrote to myself earlier come in the form of directional mark. The stripes, when you get down to it, really are just, it's black fur. They grow in the same direction as the orange fur. So I carve the orange fur in the direction of the black fur and just move around the black fur itself. I make sure that the black fur areas remain untouched so that when I ink up the surface, those areas remain black and strong and striking. They also outline the contours of the body for me. I think one of the most helpful tips that I've ever been given as an artist came from my Drawing 2 class, my Drawing 2 professor. Her name was Katherine Taylor, and she was explaining contours to me. And not the contours that you see as like the edge of an object, because that's also called the, cross, the contours. This is more specifically the cross contours. And it's kind of a confusing subject, but how she explained it was really easy for me to grasp and understand when it came to drawing, drawing visually, drawing things in 3D. And it's a concept that I use a lot when carving. It's actually probably the most important concept that I use. She explained it as thinking of an ant crawling across the surface of whatever you're trying to draw in a perfectly straight line. What path would that ant take? So if you visualize an ant walking across the flat face of a square, and if you walked in a straight line across the face of that square, it would be a straight line. But if you visualize an ant walking across a sphere, a round ball, let's just say instead of a sphere, let's make this a little bit more visually entertaining. We watched an ant walk across a basketball. Basketballs already have lines on them. So if you put that basketball flat on the ground, close your eyes, visualize the basketball sitting on the ground with one of the two center lines completely parallel to the ground that you sat it on. And you allowed an ant to walk across that center line. That path would still be straight. Now, if you just roll the ball backwards slightly, the line that's parallel to the ground is no longer parallel to the ground. It kind of looks like an arc, like an arc going up and around. Now, if you tell that ant to walk along that center line of that basketball, as it walks, it'll leave a little dotted line trace trail along the center of that line. But it's no longer a straight line across. It's an arc. It's a curving line that starts towards the center of the ball on the right hand side up around until it flattens out towards the center and then back down to the side to the left. Now, if you take that exact same concept that I described with the basketball and the ant and you apply it to the tiger, if you tell that ant to start on the spine of the tiger's back and walk in a straight line down the side of the tiger to its belly, that ant would not follow an exact straight line visually for you. It would kind of be curved to the, to the cross contour of the tiger because the tiger is not flat. It is not like the first cube. It is more like the sphere. It's more like the basketball. As it walks around, it's going to kind of bow outwards as it gets to the ribs and then visually get back closer to the center line as it gets down towards the belly. And that's what I'm doing with these stripes. That's what I'm doing with these car carved lines. I'm using those lines to inform the shape of the tiger. 
another trick that I use, and you're about to see it come into play here on the back leg of the tiger, is that as something begins, begins to get overlapped, the closer it gets to the object that's overlapping it, the less marks that I use. It's kind of like a gradient. Think of, a, think of it as exactly as a gradient, like when you see in a sunset where it, it changes from a, from a bright yellow at the bottom where the sun is as you go up to a darker purple. Now you can see in the back leg, I've opened up a lot less area as I get closer to where the shadow of the front leg will hit the back leg. And a lot more area as I'm currently opening up on the bottom of the foot to give the illusion that more light is hitting it the further away I get from the body. It's kind of like crosshatching, except it works in the exact opposite way. The more area that I take away from the wood, the less darkness there will be when I ink it up. The less area that I take away from the wood, the more darkness or surface area will remain. With crosshatching, the more lines that you draw, the more black, the more darkness you're creating. With crosshatching, the less lines that you draw, the more white of the paper you're allowing to show through. And with those two basic principles working together, I have a finished tiger carving. Now it's time to paint it. A lot of times I get asked, well, why do you paint this? Does it show up when it prints? The answer is no, it doesn't. I paint this because I intend this to be the final piece. If I wanted to add color to a print, I would do it in different ways. Too complicated to explain right here. I make these as one of a kind original pieces of art, never to be printed. I guess it's my version of a painting. I am using paint, but it's a carved painting. As you can see, I am doing a lot of color mixing. I'm using bright yellows on the back to, to kind of indicate a highlight. And if this was a more complicated piece, I'd be doing a lot more color mixing. But in reality, there's just only oranges and yellows and the white areas aren't big enough to have a whole lot of fun with. And now probably the most satisfying part of the whole process, the inking. Because it's carved, only the surface of the wood that accepts the ink. The lowered areas that I painted into, will never, the ink will never touch it. So when my flat inked up brayer, the roller that you see, moves over the surface and only comes in contact with the surface of the wood that was never carved away, while the colors in the recessed areas remain vibrant and bright and colorful. And that's how I took a simple piece of birch plywood and turned it into a bright, fun, happy, yet still very strong tiger. Thanks for watching.